Thank you for joining our online service in Living Word IT Park. You may join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. for our English service. You may also give your love offering through online bank transfer or over-the-counter direct deposit. Bank details are shown on the screen. Last week, Pastor Daryl preached about the joy of relational discipleship. Now, as we begin our series on the book of Philippians, we will see the foundation of Paul's relational discipleship with the Philippian church. I believe understanding the foundation or the essence of relational discipleship is very important, especially today. Because of the pandemic, we know many Christians are experiencing loneliness, discouragement, and depression. And with no interaction or accountability with fellow believers, I wouldn't be surprised if some Christians have gone back to their old ways and are now living in sin. That should not be the, be the case. And I believe that is very unfortunate because God has given us the means by which we can be protected from temptation. He has given us the means where we can receive and give care he has given us the means where we can receive encouragement. And we know that is experienced or received through the local church. And so if you are not a committed member of a local church, you are actually missing a lot of spiritual benefits. Benefits that can only be derived when you are surrounded by godly Christians who are committed to the Lord and to your growth as a Christian. And so through Paul's letter, I, I hope we would be reminded that we need each other. We need the local church. The church is essential to our growth. You see, the Christian life is not meant to be lived in isolation. We need to understand that we are all part of God's family and belonging to God's family implies a commitment to one another, a kind of friendship that is not superficial, but a kind of friendship that is real, a friendship that is rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we study this letter, we will see that Paul's friendship with the Philippian church is further demonstrated by the oft-noted expressions of deep affection. Their friendship was real. Paul shared a genuine, intimate bond with, this, with these believers in Philippi, and that is really expressed in his epistle to them. For example, in chapter 1, verse 7, Paul states, I have you in my heart. Chapter 1, verse 8, I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1, my beloved brothers and sisters, whom I long for, my joy and my crown. And even more so, their friendship is exhibited in a variety of ways. Paul's praying for them in chapter 1, verse 4, and they're praying for him in chapter 1, verse 19. The recent gift for Paul and his acknowledgement of it. And so this language clearly indicates mutuality and reciprocity in their friendship. Now, unlike other friendships, their friendship was not based on their ethnicity. It was not based on their personalities. It was not based on a hobby or some preference. Their friendship was centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while it is true that they had many differences, it was the gospel that united their hearts to pursue a common goal. And so we see that their friendship is radically transformed. It is radically transformed from a two-way to a three-way bond between Paul, the Philippians, and Christ. And obviously, it is Christ who is the center and the focus of everything. This three-way bond, which is the glue that holds the entire letter together from beginning to end, may be best illustrated with the following graphic. As you can see, their friendship is predicated on their mutual partnership in the gospel. 
Theirs has been a partnership in the gospel from the very beginning, a partnership that involved the Philippians themselves in evangelism and in furthering the gospel through their support of Paul. And so let us read our text, beginning in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to commit this new series to you, our series on the book of Philippians. I pray that you would use this series, O oh God, to help us know more about your grace, to know more about your truth, your gospel, and your mercy. And may this motivate us, O oh Father, to live godly and upright lives in this present age. For we know, Lord, we need each other in this, in this spiritual warfare that we are in. We need to be encouraged. We need to be prayed for. We need to receive spiritual care from the body of Christ. And we thank you, O God, for allowing us to be part of this church, Living Word IT Park. And though some of us have been separated from each other for for more than a year now because of this pandemic, we know it is your gospel that that unites our hearts and causes us, O Lord, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we commit to you this series in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we dive into our text, uh, I first want us to see how Paul's friendship with the Philippian church began. And I believe understanding the historical background of this epistle can help us understand the context and the authorial intent of Paul's epistle. You see, in AD 51, Paul, in obedience to a vision, made the momentous decision of leaving the Middle Eastern setting of Asia Minor. With Silas, Timothy, and Luke, he set sail for what we now call Europe. His first stop was the Roman colony of Philippi, a city of considerable importance in the ancient world. In the mid-first century, Philippi, although not large, was a strategically located city with a rich heritage and a distinctive culture. It spilled down a mountainside and onto a fertile, well-watered plain about 10 miles inland from the important port of Neapolis. The Ignatian Way, a critical artery of commerce linking the city of Rome with its eastern provinces, passed through the city center. And so its strategic location made it a well-developed and prosperous city. So Paul went to this city in his first missionary journey. And we need to understand that on Paul's first missionary journey, he made a habit of going first to the synagogue in the towns to which he traveled. But in Philippi, he found only a place outside the city gate and by a river where some women who worshiped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob gathered each Sabbath for prayer. Presumably, not enough Jewish men lived in Philippi to form a synagogue, and the women may have sought out the site because Jewish worship was not welcome in this deeply Roman city. And so as Paul met a group of faithful Jewish women, he was given the privilege to share the gospel. And the gospel message was well received. These women came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They trusted in Him and gave their lives to Him. And so the church in Philippi was born. And it is important to note that this church, the church in Philippi, is the first church that the Apostle Paul planted in Europe. And so this is a very significant and historical city. Now, Paul's experiences in that city were not all pleasant. They included conflict and imprisonment. But despite such struggles, the Philippian church appears to have been a reliable church for the Apostle Paul. You see, the Philippians were willing to support Paul's missionary efforts in other towns from the beginning. 
and he gave him help even during times when other churches were unwilling or unable to assist him. In addition, the Philippians gave generously to Paul's collection for the famine-stricken churches of Jerusalem that Paul could use them and other Macedonian churches as examples to the Corinthians of people who had the gift of giving or the grace of giving. And all of this generosity, moreover, came not from any abundance of resources, but from poverty. Despite their poverty and the financial hardships that these Christians in Philippi experienced, it did not stop them from giving generously and sacrificially to the famine-stricken churches in Jerusalem. In fact, when Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he said, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. And so it's really encouraging to know that despite the poverty, the suffering, the hardships that the Philippian believers experienced during this time, they were more than willing to give their resources to support the work of God in Jerusalem. Now, at the time of writing, Paul was in prison as a result of Jewish persecution. If, as is supposed, that this epistle was written at the beginning of Paul's imprisonment in Rome, we must assign to it the date A.D. 62. And so while Paul was under house arrest, he received a monetary gift from the Philippians through their emissary named Epaphroditus. So during this difficult time, Paul must have valued this tangible and sacrificial support of his efforts to proclaim the gospel as a token of genuine friendship. And so on that basis, we can conclude that Paul wrote this letter to thank the Philippians for the gift he received through Epaphroditus. Furthermore, when Epaphroditus told him about the situation back home in Philippi, which involved opposition and suffering at the hands of their pagan persecutors and some internal unrest, especially between two prominent women in the Philippian church, Paul wrote this letter to instruct and encourage them to pursue what is right in the sight of God. But I believe the ultimate urgency of this letter is the gospel, which in this letter takes the form of the advance of the gospel. You see, Paul's and the Philippians' relationship is described in terms of participation or partnership in the gospel. Paul himself is in prison for the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, an imprisonment that has, in fact, brought the advance of the gospel. And so Paul's concern for the Philippians is for their own progress in the faith. And his major concern in this regard is that they get their corporate act together for the sake of the gospel in Philippi. The Apostle Paul knows that a divided church cannot glorify God. A divided church cannot be a good testimony to a watching world. And as much as Paul appreciated the gift that he sent them, Paul wants them to be reminded that they are not just to care for him as an apostle, but they are to care for one another. And so they need to settle this conflict that was taking place in the church so that they could be an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in the city of Philippi. And so clearly, Paul values gospel-centered friendship. And Paul understands that this friendship can be threatened by division conflict, or internal unrest uh, in the church. And so as he writes this letter, he wants not only to thank them for their gift, but he wants to encourage them to pursue or preserve unity in the church. And so this letter will show us 
how leaders and members can work together as ministry partners. It will show the need to follow the godly example of the Apostle Paul and Timothy. And of course, it will show us how we should follow the example of Jesus Christ, especially in the area of servanthood and humility. And so this is an epistle that really teaches us how we can glorify God as individuals and as a church. Now, as a member of our church, have you ever asked yourself, how can I partner with the leaders in the church? What are some of the ways or opportunities that I can help them reach more people for Christ? What are some of the things that I need to pursue so that I can experience gospel-centered friendships in our local church? Well, in this sermon, we will discover the marks of a gospel-centered friendship. And so let's begin in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Notice Paul includes Timothy in his greeting. Now, this feature does not indicate co-authorship. We know that the Apostle Paul is the sole author of this epistle. But we should not ignore or downplay the significance of Timothy's inclusion in Paul's greeting. You see, most commentators state that not only was Timothy actively involved in the evangelization of Macedonia, but he also appears to have provided special support for Paul during his imprisonment. There's also good reason to believe that the Philippians had a strong attachment to Timothy. You see, this faithful minister constituted a link that bonded the Apostle Paul with his Macedonian congregation. And so it would have been surprising had his name been omitted. Now, Paul describes himself and Timothy as servants of Jesus Christ. Now, the Greek word for servants here is doulos, and in the Greek culture, doulos usually referred to the involuntary permanent service of a slave. But the use in the epistles of Paul and Peter elevates the meaning of doulos to the Hebrew sense, which describes a servant who willingly commits himself to serve a master he loves and respects. Dr. Wayne Barber has an excellent and practical explanation of the significance of this word. He asked, why do you serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, some of the people that he asked responded this way, well, I had better. God will kill me if I don't. And he said, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who have that kind of mentality. It is as if God has a big club, and if you don't do what He wants you to do, then He will hit you over the head with it. And so they serve the Lord under compulsion. They serve the Lord dutifully. But the person who truly understands what it means to be redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ has a different response. He will say, Lord, you have overwhelmed me with your grace, love, and mercy. I am so grateful for the gift of salvation that you have granted to me through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And out of that love, Lord, out of this gratitude, I am making a choice out of love for you to be your slave, to be your servant. Now, as a Christian, you need to come to the place in your life that you are willing to say, God, it doesn't matter what you tell me to do. I am willing to be submissive to your will. And when you come to that place, God will do things through you like he did through Paul and Timothy. You see, they were both slaves of Christ by God's sovereign choice of them to salvation and by their own choice out of gratitude for salvation. And so they were voluntarily submitted to Christ. And that is the kind of attitude that we need to have if we are to serve the Lord Jesus faithfully and those around us. Now, there's an interesting fact that I want to highlight in this verse. I mentioned earlier that 
Paul described himself as a doulos or a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't actually describe himself as an apostle in this epistle. And I think that's because in Philippi, his apostolic authority was not being questioned or challenged. And so he did not pull rank. See, Philippians is a letter primarily of friendship and exhortation, not of persuasion. And so Paul does not need to remind them of his apostleship. They are convinced that Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so from that, we can see that Paul led from a position of servanthood. He understood his role not as a power-hungry dictator, but as a humble servant leader who never sought to abuse his authority. Now, I know it's not easy to find an attitude like that, especially in our world. But for a disciple of Jesus Christ, servanthood is one of the keys to grow in Christ-likeness. If you are a believer, if you have been saved by the grace of God, your life should manifest Christ-like service. We know when Jesus described his own ministry, he said, for the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so one implication that I can see in Paul's greeting is gospel-centered friendship embodies Christ-like service. You see, when we give Jesus Christ His rightful place in our lives, His Lordship will be expressed in the way we serve Him and in the way we serve others, especially those who belong to the church. Therefore, one of the best ways we can demonstrate our love for God is by showing love for our fellow man, especially those who are part of the local church. And so we demonstrate love for others by helping them, by encouraging them, by praying for them, sharing their problems, and, and by doing what we can for them. And so why should we serve this way? Well, we should serve for Jesus' sake. We should serve for the sake of of the gospel, we should serve for the sake of our fellow believers in Christ. And so by using doulos, Paul is saying, I am a slave of Jesus Christ and I am absolutely sold out to do His will. I am willing to do whatever He tells me to do. Now, as you think about Paul's example, let me ask you, would you be able to say, by God's grace, I'm willing to go wherever God leads me. I'm willing to do whatever God wants me to do. I'm going to serve Him for all eternity and I'm going to love the people He has called me to serve. Now I know, as what I said earlier, that our church life has been disrupted in so many ways. But let me just remind everyone that just because we're experiencing a pandemic, just because church life is kind of abnormal these days, doesn't mean we go on a spiritual vacation. It doesn't mean we take a spiritual break. It doesn't mean we stop being Christians. In fact, it is during times of crisis and difficulties that God calls us to shine as lights in the world. We are salt and light, as what Jesus said. And so we need to keep that in mind. We need to remember what we have been called to do by God as bond slaves of Jesus Christ. And so by constructing his greeting in this manner, Paul has shown concern, not for his own interests, but for the interests of others. And he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Now, notice how he calls the believers in Philippi. He calls every Christian at Philippi a saint. Perhaps you think of a saint as some holy canonized person wearing a black robe who is an untouchable, who never smiles at all. 
Well, not so. Saints are not special Christians, but Christians just like you and me. Saints are not spiritual giants, but plain, ordinary people who love Christ and desire to serve Him. You see, the word saint means one set apart. Saints are those who have been positionally separated unto God because God has chosen them to salvation in Christ. And so that is our identity as Christians. We are saints from God's perspective. And while every Christian is a saint separated unto Christ, we need to remember that it is the duty of every Christian to live saint-like in one's experience. One pastor said, there would be something wrong about a prince living like a beggar or a grown-up person behaving like a child. A saints, let's be what we are. So let us remember that our identity in Christ as saints must lead to conformity to Christ. You see, one of the world's most damaging accusations against us is that we do not act up to our profession. W.Y. Fullerton once said, a Christian is a Christ one. Let him then be Christly. And so what a tremendous impression would be made upon the world if only we Christians were what we are. So Paul says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, so not only are they saints, but Paul reminds them that they are saints in Christ Jesus. Now the phrase in Christ is the key to understanding our salvation. You see, all Christians have been put into spiritual union with Christ at the moment of salvation. And so the key to life in Christ lies, first of all, in our common experience of grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, we are secure. We have everything that we need. In Christ, the peace of God patrols and guards our hearts, and His riches are laid open to meet our needs. In Christ, we develop new affections. In Christ, we have a new way of looking at life. In Christ, we have a different way of seeing life. In Christ, we see God's sovereign hand in all things. In Christ, we discover our identity as saints in the church and as Christians in the world. And so being in Christ helps us understand who we really are in God's sight. John MacArthur notes that a Buddhist does not speak of himself as in Buddha, nor does a Muslim speak of himself as in Muhammad. A Christian scientist is not in Mary Baker Eddy or a Mormon in Joseph Smith. They may faithfully follow the teaching and example of those religious leaders, but they are not in them. Only Christians can claim to be in their Lord because they have been made spiritually one with Him. And so as we live our lives as Christians, let us always remember that we are saints in Christ Jesus. Now in this greeting, uh, Paul greets the overseers and deacons. And by the way, this is the only Pauline letter where these people were included in his greeting. So who are these overseers and deacons? Well, overseers is a term used to emphasize the leadership responsibilities of those who are elders, who are also called pastors. While the term translated deacon simply means servant, they seem to have been special servants who operated in performing the tasks of the church under the supervision of the elders. Although Paul singles out the overseers and deacons in his greeting, uh, he does not write only to them. We all know that this letter is addressed to the entire congregation uh, in Philippi. And so one of the implications that I see in this verse is 
Gospel-centered friendship develops in a local church. The reason why they were able to serve one another and proclaim the gospel together as a church, the reason why they could encourage and love one another is because they were all part of this local church in Philippi. Hence, the church is essential to the Christian's spiritual growth. Without it, we cannot grow spiritually. Without it, we cannot receive spiritual care, encouragement. Without it, we won't be able to know our needs and pray for one another. And so this is something that really needs to be emphasized, especially during this pandemic. Now, while we are grateful for the gift of technology and how it allows pastors to broadcast their sermons online, we must always remember that this should not be seen as the new normal in the evangelical church. Christians must realize how essential it is to be part of a local church. It is essential to their spiritual growth and to their witness as Christians. And so let me ask you, are you part of a local church? Or maybe a better question could be, are you a committed member of your local church? And during this pandemic, are you trying to find ways to serve others in the church? Do you pray for them? Do you encourage them when they are down or when they are in need? Now, as you seek to be a committed member of a local church, let me say that it won't be a bed of roses. Some people will let you down. Like any other friendship, a gospel-centered friendship is tested by trials and conflict. And I think in this pandemic, our friendships, our relationships as, as Christians in the local church is somehow being tested. See, being part of a local church requires great commitment because there will be times we will experience conflict and challenges. And we need to accept that as a reality in church life. That's part of church life. Every church has its own challenges, its own struggles and hardships. But we need to remember that these challenges or relational conflict must not be a reason for us to leave the church. Apparently, in the church in Philippi, they were experiencing some form of division. And it somehow threatened the unity of this church, which is why Paul in this epistle highlights the importance of Christian unity. Paul says that Christian unity is necessary for withstanding the onslaught of forces hostile to the gospel. Christian unity is essential for presenting a credible witness to the unbelieving world and above all for being found blameless and pure on the day of Christ. And so Christian unity is absolutely crucial to being a Christian. But that unity, of course, is only Christian if it is founded on the apostolic gospel of Christ and Him crucified. We belong to one another only through and in Jesus Christ. Which is why Paul gives commands and offered examples of unifying conduct for his readers to follow. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit and do everything without complaining and arguing and a willingness to put the interest of others first. And we discover that Christ's willingness to humble himself provides a model for us to follow. And we will see that in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul also uses Timothy as an example because of his willingness to put the Philippians ahead of his own interests and Epaphroditus' willingness to risk his life to help Paul. And so these models provide illustrations of Christian unity in action. But then again, most Christians today do not seek to preserve the unity of a church. They are highly critical and have a consumer mindset. And so when things don't go their way, they leave the church and they soon develop a habit of hopping from one church to another because of their critical attitude. 
And that's what really happens when you focus on the imperfections of the church. That's what happens when we do not clothe ourselves with humility. And so if we want to pursue gospel friendships in the local church, we need to understand that it necessitates great commitment on our part. And it requires humility, a lot of humility, to remain in a church that is full of imperfect people. And in verse 2, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we can see that Paul combines a Gentile and Hebrew greeting to the Philippians. The Gentiles, especially the Romans, would begin their letters by the word greetings, which was from the Latin word grace. The Hebrews, on the other hand, would begin their letters by the word shalom, which means peace. Now, Paul had more in mind than just those superficial greetings. For Paul, this is the grace in which believers now stand. Since through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, God has atoned for their sin and brought the hostility that sin engendered between God and His creation to an end. You see, God has given Himself to His people bountifully and mercifully in Christ. Similarly, the peace Paul commends to the Philippians is the blessing of reconciliation that has resulted from God's gracious work on their behalf. And so we can say that God's grace is the root of our salvation, while peace is the fruit of our salvation in Christ. But for Paul, grace and peace are not only the objective status we enjoy before God. John Piper says, they are also the experiential enjoyment of that status. So one of the implications that we can see in Paul's greeting is gospel-centered friendship enjoys the blessings of grace and peace. You see, Paul desires that they experience an increase of grace and peace. Paul doesn't say grace to you and peace unless you have all there is to have. He assumes we need more grace and peace. And of course we do. In this life, we will never be able to say, I have arrived. I have all the grace and peace I can use. No, you don't. In fact, during this pandemic, you and I need more of God's grace and peace. And we don't have to worry about a shortage of God's grace and peace because they come from a double source. Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have a double source of grace and peace. It comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to rejoice knowing that grace and peace are not exhausted. Grace and peace will always be available to God's children. There will never be a shortage of God's grace and peace for us because God richly supplies them every single day of our lives. There is not a day that God doesn't give you His grace and peace. It is always available for you. But I think the problem is we forget that. We get so overwhelmed by our problems in life that we forget that His grace and peace are always there for us. That is why Paul is asking that they experience the grace and peace of God in their Christian lives. You see, in Christ, we not only have peace with God, but we can also experience the peace of God, that inner stability in the midst of outward crisis. And by the way, this peace of God is not tranquility from all problems and conflict, but inner confidence, which only those who are in Christ can experience. Remember the promise that Jesus gave in John 14, 27? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so Paul 
is able to greet them this way because he has personally experienced the grace and peace of God. We know the testimony of the Apostle Paul. Before he came to know Jesus, he was a persecutor of the Christian church. He was responsible for the martyrdom of Stephen. He wanted to put an end to this growing movement. He wanted to kill and imprison these Christians. But on his way to persecute more Christians, he had an encounter. He had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus asked him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul understood that to persecute Christians is to really persecute the Lord himself. Because Christians are united to Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And instead of being judged by Christ for the violence or the persecution that he inflicted on these Christians, the Apostle Paul experienced the grace and mercy of God. And on that day, his life was changed. He was radically transformed. And as, a, as, a, and as an apostle, as a missionary, as a Christian, Paul also experienced the peace of God. In fact, as he was writing this letter, he was in prison. And yet Philippians really explodes with language that reveals the kind of joy that Paul had in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no hint of bitterness. There's no hint of resentment. Paul is just thankful. He's just so grateful to the Lord for His grace, mercy, and peace. And so let us always remember that both grace and peace flow from God our Father and were made effective in our human history through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so let me ask you, do you know the grace and peace of God? Do you have peace with God? Have you been reconciled to God? Have you been a recipient of His saving grace? Have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And now that you have been saved, do you consider yourself as a bond slave of Jesus Christ? Are you now more concerned about the needs of others? Are you a committed member of the church? Do you pursue gospel-centered friendships? Now, if you are a true Christian, you will be able to answer all those questions with a definite yes. But if you have doubts about your own salvation and your commitment as a Christian, well, I have good news for you. The source of this grace and peace does not lie within you, but within the power of God the Father and the work of God the Son. Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Now for modern readers, Jesus' definition of love and friendship in John 15, 13, to lay down one's life for one's friend is completely unprecedented. Most contemporary language about friendship does not speak in terms of of life and death. We celebrate with our friends. We eat with our friends. We take vacations with friends. We are there when a friend is in need. But the modern ideal of friendship is not someone who lays down his life on behalf of another. But in the ancient world, however, Jesus' words articulated a well-known ideal for friendship. It was not a brand new idea. You see, Jesus gave everything to his friends. Friends who betrayed him, who disappointed him in so many ways. It did not stop Jesus. Their actions did not stop him from laying down his life for them. And because Jesus loved Without limits, He makes it possible for us 
to live a life of friendship because we have been transformed by everything He shared with us. You see, Christ was and is and is to come. In Him, the church still exists. Through Him, the church is still equipped with grace upon grace. And unto Him, it will be gathered without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And so it is by prayer, church, that we would continually rely on the grace of God, that we would continually be amazed about the kind of love that Jesus displayed for sinners like us. And I pray that this love and this grace that we have received from Him would inspire us and motivate us to love others the same way He has loved us. And so, may we pursue gospel-centered friendships for the glory of God and for our own spiritual growth and development and for the good of the church. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to start a new series. I thank you for Paul's letter to the Philippian church. I pray that it would inspire us, Lord, to be sacrificial, to be humble, to manifest Christ-like service and love. I pray that you would use this letter to strengthen our friendship. May our friendship, O oh Lord, be rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you would use our relationships, you would use our church to help us grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, to protect us from temptation, and to cause us, Father God, to glorify you with one voice, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ here in our city. Lord, whatever has been accomplished today, we give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.